So thanks for checking out this video. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand how much God has shown his love for us in Jesus. At Brainerd, we want to help people who are far from God to become committed followers of Jesus. But still, you know, nothing replaces what God does when followers of Jesus actually gather together in community as a church. So this video could never be a substitute for that. And our prayer is if you haven't found a church home, you would find that soon. And with that, let me tell you, we'd love to meet you sometime soon at Brainerd. So I pray that God speaks to you, and please reach out if we can answer any questions or serve you in any way. Thank you, Paul, for leading us in that time. And um, Kaylee, that's a special opportunity for our, our church. I'm glad we do these things as a church, recognizing um, it's not just family, but it's a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ that uh, love and care about you a whole lot. We're going to be reading from Psalm 1, so if you have your Bible, could you take that and turn there? If you don't have a copy of God's Word that you brought, there should be one even in front of you, and the words will be on the screen. Psalm 1, going through uh, three different psalms. Last week was Psalm 19, today is Psalm 1, and Lord willing, next week, Psalm 119. Let me read. Psalm 1 says this, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Let's pray. Father, we hear your word, and I pray that you would take your word and plant it deep in us, and I pray that we would have a heart that's ready to obey, a heart that's ready to learn, and I pray that you would speak to us wherever we are in whatever spiritual condition we are, that you would open our eyes to see what your instruction has for us today. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. So some of you, maybe many of you, are engineers. And even if you're not, let's say, vocationally an engineer, maybe that is how your brain tends to work. I'd imagine there are even kids in the room where you just kind of like to know the process. Like flow charts are something that you really enjoy. And if that is you, I think this psalm is for you. You can see how life can be engineered. You can put two alternatives side by side in this psalm. A lot of psalms work that way. This one, I think even above others, does that. So alternatives here, right? Life can be lived like a tree, almost a Garden of Eden tree in verse 3. It's healthy. It produces fruit. It produces a lot of fruit. It's this picture of a life, a life that isn't wasted, a life that's not consumed by a ton of regret, a life that becomes super productive, so much to show for living. So that's one side of it. That's one way you can live your life. And Psalm 1, in very stark terms, gives you an alternative to that. And the alternative in verse 4 is that your life can be like chaff. The idea there is that there's just no weight to it. It just kind of blows, blows away. It's easy to be discarded. There's really no use for it. Nothing seems to be lost by not having it. I mean, it's, it's a stark alternative, isn't it? And it even adds another layer to that alternative in verses 5 and 6. Because it says it's not only that it's chaff, but this alternative way of living 
is actually you're under judgment. In other words, you're, it's like a, a building that has a condemned sign on it. Or it's like you failed the test. Or it's like you have been pronounced, it's been pronounced guilty over your life. You didn't meet the standard. The consequences are not only terrible, they're eternal. I mean, that is the picture. Your current life turns out to be a waste and your eternity is ruined. I mean, this gives us these alternatives. And if you have your engineer hat on, Psalm 1 can almost become a simple matter of inputs and outputs. If we kind of looked at it negatively in the terms of verse 1, if you could just avoid, if you could just avoid the company of those who are headed in the wrong direction, if you could just avoid that company, if you could like not listen to those who give advice that's destructive, well then, that's the right input. Or if you kind of take it on the positive side, verse 2 there in Psalm 1 seems to be like a lever, all right? And the lever seems to be this. The lever seems to be the instruction of the Lord. If I can just accumulate as much instruction as possible, then that, that lever's going to work. And, and this instruction of the Lord that's in verse 2, that instruction is authoritative from God. So some of your translations are going to say the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. But this translation chooses instruction. How, what we're supposed to understand is this instruction is authoritative from God. And whether God gives it explicitly as a command or gives it by prohibition or it's just God telling us how he wants us to live, it's the law. That's what we're supposed to do. And God gives us the strength and capacity and he says, here's the way, and I'm going to give you the strength to walk in it. We hear what God says, and in faith we do it. This, it does feel a little bit like basic engineering here. His delight is in the instruction of the Lord, and if we just, if we just lean into that instruction, then our lives will go a certain direction. But when you read this, it does seem like this is more than just calculated engineering. You don't need a sermon that is just calculated engineering. Actually, two words in that verse keep me from thinking this is just engineering. One of those words is delight, and another is meditate. And oh, this psalm is so deep, and there are so many places we could like do deep dives on certain words, but I really would like for a few moments here to do a deep dive on those words on the idea of delight and on the idea of meditating. Can we start with the idea of delight? So the idea of delight is that something's going on in your heart. Something's going on in your heart for you to delight. Some synonyms would be like pleasure or satisfaction. The idea is that you have a heart posture towards something. This is something, a delight. if it's a delight, it's something that really, really matters to you. So think of something that's satisfying. You see that word, like think of something that's satisfying. So for you, that might be a good meal. For you, that might be conversation with friends. For you, that might be maybe hobby or exercise. Or for you, it might be like this finished project. You're done and you're satisfied and you can take pleasure in it. Or for you, it might be this picture of your family and you look at it and it brings a lot of satisfaction. Because you delight in something. We know this, all right? We know if we delight in it, we schedule around it, we make plans for it, we, there's some intentionality about it. We plan in advance, we're highly motivated to see it happen. Because we delight in something, we recall, we think back to those days uh, uh, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, and because we delight in it, it, it comes to mind like that. It's not that hard to remember. Because we delight in something, we talk about it. We get excited about it. It changes us. Things that we love, things that matter to us change us. It changes our perspective. And if we don't delight in it, there's a whole host of things that we don't delight in. And actually, it's easy to procrastinate, isn't it? It's easy to neglect. We just like 
forget about it. We don't work very hard to remember it. it. Causes frustration. If we do have to do it, it's kind of begrudging. I really don't want to, but I guess I will because I have to. It's the opposite of delight. Can we be honest? When it comes to things that really delight us, again, the word satisfaction, pleasure, things that delight us, I think most of us would recognize that a small percentage of that may be passive. So think like, I don't know, you, you watch sports or you watch a movie and you're just passively watching. A small percentage of that might be passive. But a lot of what brings satisfaction actually takes a lot of time. And it actually means that, that we, we extend some effort. We exert ourselves. Things that bring deep delight, things that bring long-term satisfaction require some level of effort and discipline and, and time component. Listen, I know you know that in five minutes I could, I could get as many Reese's peanut butter cups as I could eat and that would bring some amount of delight because I really like them. So I could get that in about five minutes, I have no doubt. But that's just like, that is small in comparison in comparison to a great, well-cooked meal that I sit down with friends that I deeply love, that's going to take a while. That's going to take some time. So there might be a small percentage of things in your life where you're just passive and you take delight in. Most of the things you're going to have to work for. You're going to have to give time and effort. And if we go back to verse 2, the the one who is going to be planted beside flowing streams that bear fruit in its season means his or her delight is going to be in the Lord's instruction, hearing what God has to say and taking delight in it. But it also says in that, the Lord's instruction, you meditate day and night. So again, can we do a deep dive? We, we do a deep dive on delight, but can we also think a little bit more carefully about meditate I'm always fearful of words that are almost functional, like church words or Bible words that we, we kind of have an idea of what they mean, but we really don't take them into account because I think the Bible's too, too important for us to just kind of shake our heads politely as, and yet not really apply it. So what does it mean to meditate? Something is going on there in our head, not just in our heart, but in our head. We're, we're thinking about it. We're, we're preoccupied with it. The idea is one of not just hard posture, but frequent engagement, frequent contact. You meditate in it day and night. You're, you're chewing on it. You become preoccupied. Interesting, the word in the original Hebrew, it actually involves your mind and your mouth, almost like you're muttering something. You're, you're talking to yourself. Some of you talk to yourself a lot. And see, it's biblical. It's biblical. You have a reason to do that. You're preoccupied so much that you're, you're mouthing words, you're thinking about it, you're chewing on it, you're verbalizing it. There's this internal conversation with some repetition, something, if we were to say it today, it's gotten in your head. And something matters to you, that's things you delight, and something you're thinking about all the time. This is something you meditate on. God cares deeply how we think. I mean, God cares about it all, but he cares deeply about how we think and what we think about, which is why 2 Corinthians 10, some of you know this verse, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's why Romans 12, 2, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, what we think about. That's why Philippians 4, 8, some of you, it's your favorite verse, whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, then think about or ponder on or reflect on these things. So it's, it's thinking, but it's thinking to another level. An image that might be helpful to you even in really appreciating what this word means is like when you marinate something. When, when you put something in, in a marinade, it soaks the flavor in and and they don't teach food chemistry courses in seminary, but it, it begins to break some things down that makes maybe meat more tender because it's been marinating for a while, marinating in the instruction of Jesus. You could be preoccupied. You could be thinking and chewing and talking to yourself about a million things, a billion things, really. It could be that family drama that won't seem to stop. 
It could be the stock market. It could be that hobby that you're just now enjoying. It could be when Be Real is going to go off. It could be a fantasy team. It could be a video game. It could be your test scores. It could be retirement. It could be politics. You could be chewing on, marinating on a hundred things. But the one who is going to be planted beside flowing streams where fruit is going to be born in its season, she or he is going to be marinating on the Lord's instruction day and night. That's what the scripture says. Are you beginning to piece this together, what God wants from us when it comes to his instruction, his word? And I would ask you this, delight and, and meditate. Is this a picture of your life? Are you soaking in God's instruction? Are you having frequent contact with it? Is it getting inside your thoughts, informing your decisions as much as it's a discipline to do? Has it, has it, is it still a delight for you to do? Is, do you still find God's word delighting you, satisfying you, giving you pleasure? It's more than just trying to do right or being a good human being or trying to be the best you possibly can be. It's more than that. You're, you're actually finding what matters to you and what you're thinking about is the Lord's instruction to you. Maybe this is all like pretty common. Or maybe you're thinking, Curtis, I would say I know Jesus. I would say actually I love Jesus. But when you're talking about God's word in those terms, something you delight in, something you would actually soak in, Curtis, I, I, I grew up religious, but never that. Like when we would listen to a, a homily or a sermon or maybe a verse quoted, but it, it never like, Never really had that. Maybe you'd say, Curtis, in the past week or month, if you're honest, and you should be, maybe you say, in the last week or month, Curtis, I don't even remember really going to God's word or instruction other than maybe in times here when we're in church. Maybe you barely touch God's word. You don't know where you would start. Well, that's okay. We all have to start somewhere, right? We all have to start somewhere. And I'm, I want to move through... I want to do something different. I, I normally don't do this, but I want to move through like several places in Scripture because I don't just want to talk about delighting and talk about meditating. I actually want to show you how that can work. I want you to see how many different avenues God's Word, God's instruction could be flowing into your life. And I, I want that to actually inform what this next week, what the next month might look like. So you go, Curtis, I feel very, very stuck in this. I feel like everybody else like kind of knows the Bible, spends a lot of time in the Bible, but I feel like such a novice. Or you say, Curtis, I remember at one point that was my life, but it's not. I, I just want to walk with you a little bit through God's word. So maybe you are, so a few examples here. Maybe you're pretty faithful in Bible reading and you have a plan and you're following that plan as best you can. And you've, you've chosen a plan which lands you in Judges. And maybe as you are reading God's word and you're following that plan, you come to Judges and you read this verse, you'll read it a few times in Judges, that in those days there was no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And maybe as you chew on that and think about that a little bit more, you begin asking yourself, are there any ways where I'm living as if I have no king? Am I realizing how bad then and terrible that can go? And am I actually delighting and satisfying with King Jesus having all authority over my life? Am I delighting? Am I meditating? Or maybe you serve in Brainerd Kids, and I'm glad you do if you do. And maybe one week you find yourself trying to get across a lesson. So you're trying to get across a lesson from Genesis 37 and 39 and 40 about Joseph's family. And you begin to, as you prepare, you begin to realize how just dysfunctional and how messed up Joseph's family was. You remember all the pain and all the backstories and all the heartache. And maybe as you as you think about that, it causes you to be satisfied with the fact that even while your family may be terribly dysfunctional, you know what? God can work through dysfunctional families. He has in the past. He's doing it right now. He'll do it in the future. And maybe your heart begins to be satisfied with maybe just maybe dysfunction doesn't have to be passed on to other generations. And you delight in God's word. Or maybe you've chosen much like on a Sunday like today where you gather to worship and maybe you hear a sermon or maybe it's during the week and you, you, you're watching something, hearing something online, you're, you're listening to a sermon podcast and maybe it's about Job. And as you listen to the sermon, as you listen to someone explaining and expounding God's word, they begin to talk about, 
Oh, all the questions that Job had, all the defensiveness that he exhibited, and, and yet his worship. And as you listen, you find yourself satisfied more and more with, yeah, my life may be blowing up much like Job's, but if Job could trust in God's wisdom, you give, you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you also find yourself delighting that this is a God who's patient, who takes all of our questions takes all of our, our anger and our frustration that, that comes, that bubbles up to the surface when we're suffering, and he hears it, and he sees us, and he loves us. Or maybe you're, I don't know, sitting in a service, and you hear a choir saying, oh, I don't know, Psalm 130, and you've been waiting a long, long time. And you've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and it hasn't resolved. And you hear a... You hear a song, and it just kind of sweeps over you. You go, I will wait for you. And you delight in the God that you're waiting on. Or maybe you decided to memorize God's word. So maybe your scripture memory plan has a verse like Proverbs 18, 17 in it. So hear this verse. The first says this, the first to state his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him, which maybe is really helpful to you because you find yourself right in the middle of a conflict, and you're preoccupied with what to do about that, and, and this is helpful so you don't just, you feel like, I don't just have to take sides. I need to listen carefully and, and decide, is this a conflict I need to enter or help resolve? And it guides you, God's Word, and you delight in how wise you could, you could, how much wisdom you could have because of the book of Proverbs. Or maybe you like to read and you write in a journal. And maybe in reading in, in, in your, your Bible reading, maybe it's an online Bible reading plan and you begin to read Jeremiah 2, 11 and 13. So this is what Jeremiah 2 says. Has a nation ever exchanged its gods? Yet, this is God's speak, my people have exchanged glory for useless idols. My people have committed a double evil. They've abandoned me the fountain of living water, and they've dug cisterns for themselves. They've cracked, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water, and you start to meditate on how much the world has actually gotten a hold on your life, and you're like those broken cisterns, and you, your, your life's not holding together. Things just seem to be leaking. Your life seems to be a mess, and you realize, I've abandoned God. And you find delight in running back to God and going, forgive me, forgive me. Or maybe there's uh, a song, a scripture song that takes the words of Hosea 6 about returning to the Lord. So this is Hosea 6. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bind up our wounds. He will revive us after two days. And on the third day, he will raise us up so we can live in his presence. Let's strive to know the Lord. And maybe you've been far from God. Maybe your affections have been far from him, but you find great delight in the picture uh, another picture in Scripture of the, the Father God welcoming the prodigal home, saying, come on, come on. It's never too late. Now's the right time. Now's the right time. Now's the right time. Today's the day of salvation. And maybe on this day in May 2023, you come running back. And maybe nobody could even tell it, but it happened in your heart. Something turned, and you delight in the Lord. Or maybe you're in a life group, and John 15's the text, and you read John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And you meditate, you soak in, oh, God doesn't want me to be independent of him, but he actually wants me to grow my dependence on him. Or maybe you struggle with reading, maybe you have just, it's never come easy to you, so you listen to God's Word. Maybe you have an audio Bible or an app that has God's Word recorded, and you listen to Acts 2, where it says they devoted, Acts 2.42, where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together. In the temple, they broke bread from house to house. They ate more, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, and you, you begin to think more deeply. You begin to chew on. You begin to meditate. You begin to soak in the fact of the priority that they gave to being with God's people. And there seems to be a gap with the priority you give to being with God's people. And that gap begins to close as you begin to delight in what happens when God's people come together. 
or maybe the beginning of a worship service, the worship leader starts off by saying, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And you come to terms again with your need for the gospel and Jesus on the cross, risen from the dead, becomes more sweet to you than ever before because you know nothing's gonna separate you from his love. Or maybe you're reading a Christian book and it, it quotes from 1 Corinthians 6 and so you're reading it, you're reading along and 1 Corinthians 6 says, don't you know that the unrighteous won't inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived, no sexually immoral people idolaters, adulterers, males who have sex with males, no thieves, no greedy people, no drunkards, no verbally abusive people, no swindlers, swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And that gets you firmer in the conviction so you don't just like open-handed go, well, whatever the culture says must be right. No, you hold on to God's word and you chew on that, but you keep reading and you realize, and some of you used to be like this, but you were washed. You were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, and it humbles you. So you're firm in your convictions because you soaked in God's Word, and you're humbled before Him because you soaked in God's Word. Maybe you're not a morning person, so you don't read the Bible early in the morning, but at lunchtime you do. And maybe you read it, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that this thorn would leave me but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Maybe you've been totally decimated. God has brought you low. And you go, can God use a person that's this low? You go, you read that and you take great delight that it's not about you being strong, it's about his strength being shown in your weakness. And you find yourself very satisfied in the God who can take weak things and show his strength through them. Or maybe you're in a women's study or a men's group and you read no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And maybe because of everything that you watch or you listen to, your language has gotten a little coarse. It's got a little off color. You don't pause, you don't hesitate like you used to. And maybe you chew on how your speech has drifted you go, no, no, my speech is meant to be building others up. Like gossip shouldn't have a place in, in my life. Or maybe you're at a funeral and you hear the pastor say, Revelation 21.4 says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. And grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away and the one seated on the throne says, look, I am making everything new. Maybe deep in your soul, that's exactly what you needed to hear that day you went to that funeral. You needed to know that this world that seems to take so much from us, there are new heavens and new earth where everything will be made new. Do you see how this could work? See, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be a faithful pastor if I just said, we just need to all read the Bible a little more. I don't want you to just read the Bible a little bit more. I want you to delight in God's word. I want you to meditate and chew on it. I want Brainerd Baptist Church to be a congregation where God's word wins and we delight in it and we love it and we just can't, not, not to be pretentious, not to be pious, but we can't help but talk about it. We can't help but have it shape our counsel to each other. I go back to verse two. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. For a portion of you, I am guessing, I am guessing that when I, when I talk about this, this, is, this message is largely about reinforcement because I've talked about, I, I've talked with several of you and, and I know God's word is playing that sort of role in your life. I've heard you talk about God's word. I've heard some of you teach God's word and I've heard you, you read it and pray it. And I, I, I love that. And so maybe this is just more reinforcement for you of some very healthy practices in your life. 
And reinforcement is a good thing. I'm going to encourage you to like, just make sure it doesn't ever slide in the category of not really delighting you. Let me just reinforce, like it should delight you and we should be chewing on it. We're never going to get to a place where, yeah, I've kind of mastered it and don't need it anymore. This is not that kind of book. The Lord's instruction is not that kind of instruction. But maybe some of you are where I am. One of the benefits of actually having to teach this and preach this and, and know I'm going to stand in this place and talk about delighting in God's word and meditating on it is actually to do some heart inventory. So let me be as uh, transparent as I can be. And the good news is there have never been, I, don't, I can't imagine a time in history where there have been more avenues where we can take in God's word. I jotted a few of them down. You could go old school and low tech or high tech. So you could get a reading plan on you version, which I have. You can do the audio Bible on an app, which I do. You could get a journaling Bible, which I have. You can pick a Bible reading plan. I did. You can read and write prayers. You can have scripture memory cards. Got some of those. You can have a study Bible. You can have commentaries. You can have formal training. You can have free training. You can take in God's word all the time. Bad news is there have never been, I don't think there have ever been more distractions that make it hard to sit and reflect and chew and meditate and become preoccupied with God's word. My biggest obstacle, church, let me just, let me tell you, my biggest obstacle is I only have so much attention. And I'm a pretty curious person, so I like to read and I like to listen to podcasts and I, I, sports interests me and news interests me and I like reading articles and like reading magazines and sometimes I hate thinking like I might be missing something so I want to read it all. I don't want to miss any of it. But I take in so much that I actually don't have much time. Like the, my, my head can get so noisy that I actually don't have time to really go, oh God, what do you have to say for me? And it doesn't become a delight as much as it's like, it, it's pretty much like a duty and I don't meditate in it, I just kind of fly over it. And I don't have space. I, they're neutral things, most of them. But it just occupies so much space. And this week, the Lord convicted me of more white space. Like, I need to hit delete on some articles and not read them. Podcasts can go unlistened to, and it'll be okay. But what cannot happen is that I don't delight in God's word. What cannot happen is that my primary preoccupation isn't the instruction of God's word. I had to remember this, and I just want to encourage you. I, I really do think it's about making intentional, frequent, long-term investments. So much of delighting and meditating is going to be about making, and every one of those words matter, intentional, frequent, long-term investments, intentional a series of discipline choices. We have the Holy Spirit. He's going to be our helper, but it's, it's a series of discipline choices. I will turn off noise. <laughs> I will hit delete. I will get white space in my head and in my heart so that I can go, let me focus on you and your instruction to me. And it better be frequent. It's not like I can like load up once a month. It better be pretty regular this way. In his law, he meditates day and night. And then there's something over time, most people who really succeeded at something gave daily attention to it for a long, long time. And it's an investment. What's an investment? It's, it's really like you, you put something in because of the promise of something better, a desired outcome. You understand you may not experience everything right now, but in faith, you're counting on something down the road. I mean, you may experience it now, but you're counting on this investment is going to have some significant return down the road. So that's where I've been. One other thing came to mind, and, and that is maybe you're not there, maybe you're just really discouraged because when it comes to God's instruction being a delight or meditating on it, maybe there's actually barely a pulse for you. And this is the time to be honest. This is time to think about it. Maybe this is very discouraging to you. But I just want, I do want to tell you, if that's you, if like there's just barely a pulse in, in this delight and meditating, then God meets you where you are. And what if this morning, what if you and maybe some of the community around you, or, or even a pastor, just someone around you, what if we prayed about it with you? What if we prayed, Lord, give some success here? 
What if, what if we prayed in, in the words of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel talks about removing our heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh so that we would follow his statutes and keep his ordinances? Or what if we prayed, in, like Psalm 119 tells us to, to turn our heart to his decrees? What if, we could start there, couldn't we? we go, I, Curtis, I don't have that desire or delight. Well, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. Lord, increase my desire. Lord, give me the hunger to start somewhere. Give me someone I can talk to. Give me brothers and sisters who will hold me accountable. Give me some people, some brothers and sisters that will cheer me on. Let me land firmly in a community that says, let us press on to know the Lord. Like, let's do this. Delighting and meditating. What matters to you, what you think about. I don't know where this will meet you today, but I'm going to pray and ask the Lord that we would all take that next step. If it's a next step in the direction we've been going or if it's a next step evaluating our hearts, that God would give us eyes to see what's going on here and this heart posture, this frequent engagement would increase. Let's pray. We've seen today, Father, your word just, it is, the, it is the light for our pathway. We're gonna take steps and we need your light to shine to, to show us what next step to take. Your word can dislodge us from apathy. Your word can sustain us when we, all we could do is really get here today your word can breathe new life into us. When we feel very alone, your word can remind us that you're present. And so forgive us, Lord, where we take your word so casually, where I stack the 15 Bibles in my house and, and, and I'm not really chewing on any of it. Father, you can do what... Uh, what I, what I can't, you can change our heart. You can in, incline our hearts. You can push our hearts to see and delight more in your instruction to become more preoccupied with your ways. So I pray that you would do that. And where there has been little desire, I pray that you would give a desire and then this afternoon, tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, that you would give some success there some momentum would start to build. Make Brainerd Baptist the church that delights in your instruction, meditates on it day and night. We ask this for our good, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.